So, um, fantastic. So over the next uh, 40, 45 minutes or so, I'm going to be talking to you all about the idea of unseen opportunities. So this is really what they are and then how behavioural science can help us to, to uncover them. Uh, a bit of background first as to myself, um, who I am. I work for the behavioural science practice within Ogilvy Consulting in London. Um, so we're founded by Rory Sutherland, who a lot of you may have heard of. If not, highly recommend checking out his TED Talks. Um, but essentially we're a team uh, of dedicated behavioural scientists and what we try and do is understand how and why people think and behave the way they do. And we want to use the understanding to encourage people to make better decisions, uh, to design better environments, better products, better processes, etc. So anything really with human beings at its core. Uh, myself, my background is in evolutionary biology, so really trying to understand how our evolutionary history and our evolutionary past as a species affects the decisions and behaviours that we make today. So something we like to, to say in the behavioural science practice is that really if your problem could be solved rationally, you probably would have solved it by now. And actually what we're finding across various different sectors is that it's the really kind of sticky human-centred challenges that still remain. So actually the rate of technological advancement over the last few years has been really, really rapid, but we think psychology still remains kind of an untapped source of potential, so potential growth or potential effectiveness. And that's really what we try and try and get at through behavioural science. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about behavioural science. What do I mean? What is it? Um, give a, a little interactive quiz. Uh, don't worry, no one will see your answers. Just three questions. And then I'm going to talk through uh, some of my favourite examples so that you can see how we're using behavioural science to overcome some really cool challenges uh, in the modern world. So um, why are we using behavioural science and why am I talking to you about it today? Well, really what we like to say is that until recently, we think the world has been viewed through broken binoculars. We call them broken binoculars because we see the world and we see people's decisions through two lenses that we really don't think are always accurate. And the first of these lenses is neoclassical economics. So the economics thinking that says people are always rational. People weigh up the options and make a rational, logical decision or choice. Uh, if you increase the price of something, for example, then demand goes down that kind of thing. The other lens on the other side is market research. So this is the idea that people can make hypothetical decisions. So if you ask someone, they can tell you how they're feeling, they can tell you what they want, they can tell you what they would do uh, in the future, and they can explain their behaviours to you. So we like to think that we have this sense of introspection about ourselves and our own behaviours. But actually we don't think these two lenses always apply. I think a good example to show you why uh, comes from Coca-Cola. Now Coke has been the dominant soft drink across the world for, for a number of decades and if we were going to try and make a drink that was going to beat Coca-Cola, what, what would we do and how would we design it? Now you might say let's make something that's cheaper than Coca-Cola because as we know if you lower the price of something more people are going to buy it. You might say let's make it larger than Coca-Cola so then there's better value for people. Again would make sense. Or you might say just make it tastier than Coca-Cola. So if you ask people in a focus group, no one is going to say, I want a drink that tastes worse than Coca-Cola. Obviously, a cheaper, better value, tastier drink uh, sounds like a good idea. But actually, over the last few years, across the world, one of the biggest competitors to Coca-Cola has been this. It's been Red Bull. And actually, Red Bull is smaller than Coca-Cola. It's more expensive than Coca-Cola. And it just kind of tastes a bit weird, to be honest. But actually, it's those properties that have contributed to its success. So because it's smaller, because it's more expensive, we perceive it to be more premium. Because it tastes a bit weird, we believe that it's having these psychotropic effects. So we believe that it's having these effects on our psychology and our energy, um, which we wouldn't do if it just tasted like a, a strawberry flavored, delicious soft drink. It's the same with, with medicine. So medicine that actually tastes worse for us, we subconsciously perceive it as doing more good for us. Similarly with, uh, with fly spray or insect repellent, they've actually made versions of those that are far more palatable to the human sense of smell. But when they tested them, they found that people just didn't believe they were as effective. Essentially, your brain is telling you, if it smells this bad to me, imagine what it's doing to that poor fly. And this isn't something that we're consciously aware of, it's just something that 
uh, we're inferring from the situation. So I think really it's important here to understand that the opposite of a good idea, i.e. make it bigger, make it cheaper, make it tastier, can also be a good idea. And it's these kind of often counterintuitive solutions that behavioral science allows us to get to. But what do I mean by behavioral science? Um, well, essentially behavioral science is all about the fact that we're all human. So all of us are descended from a long, long line of ancestors who over millions and millions of years have evolved ways to survive uh, and reproduce. And that's in both our physiology, but also in our behavior and how the brain works. And so for most of our existence, our species was adapting for, for life in an environment that looks a bit like this. And that's great, we're really well adapted for survival in these environments. But in what has been essentially the blink of an eye in evolutionary terms, we now find ourselves in environments a bit like this. And so we get what's called an evolutionary mismatch. And that's when our biological programming isn't necessarily best adapted for the world around us today. But it's by understanding the predictable ways that the brain has evolved to work that we can begin to understand and predict how people are going to think and behave in the modern world. So for example, uh, we know a lot about loss aversion. So people are very strongly uh, hardwired to want to avoid losses far more than to, to acquire gains. And that would have made sense in our ancestral environment and therefore is how we act today as well. And there's kind of hundreds of these heuristics and biases that affect our behavior that we try and understand in order to, to change behavior in today's world. There's just one study I wanted to share with you because I think it's really interesting and it's from Google. And this Google study showed that in any one moment in, in the modern world, we are exposed to 11 million bits of information. So we've got 11 million bits of information coming in, but actually we can only consciously process 50 bits. So 11 million bits hitting our senses at any one time, 50 bits being consciously processed. And what I think behavioral science lets us do is try and work out, so what are those 50 bits that are gonna be consciously processed? What are the bits of information that we're gonna pay attention to? But then also what are the bits of information that are affecting us, but on a more subconscious level? So what are the things that are affecting our decisions and our behaviors that we don't necessarily even realize? Um, and this is, is really the crux of behavioral science. Now, before I go any further, we're gonna do a bit of an interactive quiz just to make sure everyone's listening, everyone's paying attention. And this is called the thinking fast quiz. And it's because being human means making quick decisions. So actually the vast majority of the decision, decisions we make happen in just a split second. So how is the brain making these decisions for us? Now, no one's gonna see your answers, don't worry. But I'd love everyone to get a, a pen and paper, somewhere to write the answers. And it's just gonna be three questions. I just want you to write, write down the answer that comes into your head. You're not gonna have too much time to think about it. And the answers are interesting, but they're also gonna show us something a bit deeper about how the human brain is programmed to work. So. Everyone's ready? Question number one. Which square is darker in this image? The A square or the B square? Which square is darker? Nice and easy one to start off with. Question number two. A bat and a ball cost one pound 10 in total. The bat costs one pound more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? How much does the ball cost? And question number three. What do you see in this image? Like you should just write down whatever you see. Don't worry, your personality won't be assessed based on your answers. Just like you to write down what you can see, if anything, in this picture. So, the answers then. Now, you may have guessed Square A for question one, 10 pence for question two, and you may have put a punk rocker for question three. Um, we get a lot of interesting answers to question three. Uh, you may have got punk rocker, that seems to be the most common that comes up. You might be able to, to guess from the way this is going, these aren't the real answers, but actually these are the answers that your brain may have jumped to uh, for certain kind of reasons. If we go through the real answers, uh, it tells us something a bit interesting. So for question one, which square is darker, the A square or B square? Unless there is something seriously wrong with your brain, you should be able to see A as darker than B. Now what's interesting here is that both squares are the same shade. So it's a trick question, you may have guessed. And if you remove the context gradually, 
then we can see that the squares are exactly the same. What's important though, is that as soon as I add the context back in, it is impossible for you to see them as the same shade again. So you cannot perceive A and B as being the same shade, even though you know that's the reality. And that's because B is in the shadow and you see this checkerboard pattern. And it's because we think we're seeing things in isolation. So we think we're seeing things as they are. Actually, our perception is massively influenced by the surrounding context. And just as that's the case in our visual perception, it's also the case in our decision-making and the way we, we make decisions and, and act in the world. So we think we're making decisions in isolation. Actually, our decisions are hugely influenced by the surrounding context. And we don't necessarily always realize it. Question two then, a bat and a ball cost one pound 10. How much did the ball cost? Very well done if you said five pence. Don't worry if you said 10 pence, that is what the brain naturally wants to jump to because you get one pound 10 minus one pound. Actually, I think they've, they've done this with Harvard maths graduates and they tested no better than the average person. So don't worry if you said 10. What's interesting is that if I give you more time, you can work it out and you would have got to five pence, but the brain wants to jump to the, the intuitive kind of solution. Question number three, what did you see in this image? Now, I'm hopefully about to rewire your brain. So if I show you the image with a bit of color added, a bit of grayscale, you can see that it was a frog. Now, your answers that you put are gonna be interesting. You can now compare it to what it looked like. Um, but the main thing here is that actually, if you ever see this image again, there is no way that you can see it without seeing the frog. So you can't go back to seeing this without seeing the frog in it. And that's because we think that we're seeing things as they are. Actually, a lot of what we're seeing and experiencing is based on our previous experiences and our memories. So we like to think we see things as they are and reality as, as it is. Actually, we kind of see what we're expecting to see. A really good example of this comes from these two photos. These two pictures of strawberries. And I'll ask you which side looks the most red to you. Just think which side looks the more, more vivid red. To me, I think the left-hand side looks more red. But actually here, there isn't a single drop of red in this image. So if you go through and color pick them, there's no red values in any of the colors. They're all just different shades of gray. But because we're so used to seeing strawberries as this vivid red color, it's impossible for our brains not to infer it in the image that we're seeing. So these answers are, are interesting quirks in themselves, but actually they tell us something a bit more fundamental about how the human brain works. And that is we have two different systems of thinking in the brain. So system one and system two. Now, I, I'm sure a lot of you on the call will be kind of familiar with these already, so I'm not gonna labor this point. Uh, but essentially system one is our automatic mode of thinking. System two is our very reflective mode of thinking. All of those immediate answers you got to with system one, so the 10 pence, for example, that's your um, automatic mode of thinking. And normally that gives us a pretty good answer or a pretty good decision, but it's not always correct. What's, what's important to remember is that we think we're always making decisions using system two. So we assume that we're on this system two mode of thinking all of the time with our decision making. Actually, what we now know is that over 90% of our decisions are made using system one. So actually we need to design for system one, we need to design our solutions, our interventions, our environments, knowing what we do about system one and how the human brain actually makes decisions, rather than assuming people are always very reflective, very deductive, um, very effortful and very rational. And a great example of this actually comes from the aviation industry. So in the aviation industry, when a plane crashes, there is no longer such thing as pilot error. So you used to be able to say the plane crashed because the pilot made a mistake. Now you're not allowed to say that anymore. And that's because if the pilot has been making an error, if the pilot's made a mistake in that cockpit, then it's not a fault of the pilot, it should be a fault of us designing that cockpit environment. We need to design the environment to better fit around the human brain and how the human brain works rather than blaming it on the person. And that's the same with our behavioral science solutions. We need to design our environment to better fit what we know about how the human brain actually works. So what I think behavioral science enables us to do is firstly to understand the human brain in more detail, to secondly give us a new lens for looking at challenges and problems and how we might solve them, and then thirdly, to generate these unseen opportunities or these lateral kind of solutions. So I'm gonna talk a bit about how we do that, how we get to these unseen opportunities, and then give you some examples of the, the cool, I think, examples of how we've been applying those principles to the real world. 
So in a nutshell, to get to these unseen opportunities, what we try and do is firstly understand the foundation of behavioral science. So really understanding what does the academic literature tell us about how people make decisions. And this isn't just in a lab environment, but it's in the real world. Secondly, we creatively apply that knowledge to that context, because this isn't a painting by numbers approach. One uh, solution won't always work for all contexts. So how can we creatively apply that principle, that heuristic, that bias to the current challenge, the current problem? And then finally, real world testing. So we know that different contexts are different. That's why it's so important for testing these solutions to really understand what works best and what doesn't. And when you put all these together, we get to what we think are unseen opportunities. So the latent untapped potential in an environment or in a situation. And we've been creating these unseen opportunities for basically just a really wide range of different clients and different challenges. So it's everything from communication strategy to product development, to organizational performance, to kind of environmental optimization or service optimization. At the moment, for example, we're, we're working with Thames Valley Police in the UK, looking at how the police should best approach the current situation. So really just a wide, wide range of challenges, but everything with human behavior fundamentally at its heart. So now I'm just going to talk you through uh, a few of my favorite examples that hopefully you'll find interesting. The first, which is very, very relevant for today, uh, is a project we did. Uh, this was actually before coronavirus. But it's a project to get people to wash their hands properly. So something we've heard a lot about over the last few months. Um, in, our, in our situation, this was in order to increase hand hygiene in factory workers. So factory workers in kind of food factories and abattoirs, you really needed them to wash their hands properly. And actually, I think the, the solution is can be quite relevant today. Now, as you will have seen, a lot of the messaging that people will tend to put out when you're encouraging people to do these sorts of things will be based on system two. So we very much encouraging people to do it, telling them why it's important, reminding them of the health benefits of doing it. What we try to do is think about this kind of differently. Is there anything we can do that's based on system one that gets a better result? What we did in the end was something quite simple. It was design a hand stamp. So it was just this, this hand stamp that we designed that led to a 63% reduction in the number of dirty hands in this factory. So how did it work? Well, this hand stamp uh, was specially designed with this sticky ink. And this sticky ink takes just as long to wash off your hands as factory workers should be washing their hands for. So I think it was sort of 40 seconds, perhaps 60, a long time, but they are working in, in an abattoir, so very important to do it for that length of time. But you can see why it's tempting to just skimp on the, the hand washing a little bit. This way, if you haven't washed it for the allocated time, you will still see that stamp on your hand. And that does two things. That firstly acts as a really nice bit of feedback so you can see whether you've washed your hands properly or not. And it also acts as a really subtle kind of cue to others, uh, a bit of a social cue to show that you haven't washed your hands. You don't wanna be the guy that's still got hand stamp on his hands so that everyone can see you haven't been washing your hands properly. What's interesting here is we mix this system one approach with the more system two approach you can see on the right, which is posters explaining why it's important. And like I said, this led to a 63% reduction in dirty hands. So a real system one solution that was far more effective than the solutions we might normally jump to. Interestingly here, it actually improved the most for the night shift. You can see down to 12.5%. Perhaps because in the night shift, they're more in autopilot and more in system one mode of thinking, um, but a really interesting result. And you can see it was effective across all three shifts. The next example I want to show you, share with you uh, was from the Royal Borough of Greenwich. Now we worked with them uh, a few years ago now to try and stem antisocial behavior. So perhaps a challenging uh, topic for using behavioral science um, to try and overcome, but actually I think the solution uh, was really clever. So hopefully you'll be able to see and hear this video. As the London riots of 2011 took hold, people in Greenwich burnt down the pub they drank in and looted the shops where they bought their food. But as the disturbances died down elsewhere, antisocial behavior in the area continued. Greenwich Council needed to find a way to stop the problem minority from destroying their own community. We believed that the shop shutters that were ripped from their runners were part of the problem. Could we turn the shutters into part of the solution? We wanted to conduct a social experiment. 
In 2009, a team of scientists from Pennsylvania found proof that the large head, round face and big eyes so beloved of Disney actually motivates caring behavior in adults. They proved that cute matters to the brain. If I was in local government, I know it would be a lot easier to say I'm getting more police out there than to say I'm painting a few shutters. But I think we need to work to build confidence that these kind of interventions have their role, that they work and they have their role, and get them taken seriously as hard interventions which are expensive and in the past have proven not to work. Could the power of cute minimise antisocial behaviour in Greenwich? After a campaign to recruit babies from the local area and a long night painting, we turned the unused and inhuman metal sheets into giant portraits of Greenwich babies. As the shops shut at night, the metal shutters came down to reveal the babies when they were needed most. It had a powerful effect on the community, with an 18% reduction in crime, and locals who say they feel much safer. If you've got positive images around, it makes you think positively. They are amazing. I think there should be more of it. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. And it, looks good. and it didn't take thousands of pounds or hundreds of police. Just a few cans of paint. The people of Greenwich have shown an overwhelming love for the baby. Okay. Hopefully, hopefully that video worked. I'm afraid my my screen has kind of frozen on the video. I'm not sure if it did it for everyone else, uh, but it's not letting me click off it. I'm just going to stop the share, and hopefully this will help refresh it. Did that video? Just absolutely freeze and start juddering for everyone else. Was that okay? It froze. <laughs> mm. We're doing so well with the technology. I think you saw you saw the the bump of the video. Um, I'm struggling now to. Be able to share the presentation again. Let me close PowerPoint and open again. Sorry, everyone. Okay, let's try again. I'm basically getting a just a black slide uh, for every slide at the moment, which makes it kind of hard to present from. But hopefully, this has worked. I've just restarted it. Okay, there we go. I can now <laughs> I can now see the presentation again. Can people see the presentation again now? Yes, we can see it. Thanks. Excellent. Good stuff. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. I knew that would happen at some point. Cool. Uh, so, hopefully, uh, you got most of that video. But I think just uh, a quite an interesting solution where you might think it's kind of trivial. Um, paint a few shop shutters. Actually, as you can see, the effects uh, can be quite big. The next example I want to hopefully share with you without any technological disasters uh, is some work that we've done for Christian Aid. Now, Christian Aid, for those that don't know, are a, a UK-based charity and helping people, uh, not just Christians, but everyone, helping people in poverty. And each year, Christian Aid runs something called Christian Aid Week, and this is where volunteers hand deliver um, envelopes to, to homes across the country. And if you want to donate, you put some money in the envelope and then the volunteer will collect it a week later. However, uh, donations have been falling year on year. So they asked us, is there anything we can do with behavioral science to try and increase the number of donations that we were getting? So we wanted to encourage more people to donate and also encourage people to donate more to this charity. So what do we do? Uh, we first looked at the, the barriers and drivers to charitable giving, so the behavioural biases and kind of levers that we can pull. And we use those to come up with six new optimised donation envelopes, so with six different principles across each one. And we conducted a massive randomised control trial across the UK to test which ones will work the best. So I'd love to share those new optimised optimize envelopes with you now. So firstly, um, we intervened with something called the labour illusion. And this is where if you believe more effort, time, energy has been devoted um, into something for you, then you tend to value it more. So here we just added this stamp to the envelope saying hand delivered by your local volunteer and hand collected, because it was. Uh, the next 
intervention was just adding up the scarcity. So we know when things are scarce, we tend to value them more. When things are limited time only, for example, uh, we tend to want it more. So here we're just making it very clear, we're collecting donations for this week only. So driving home, this is a limited time thing. And again, just something to point out is that we're not actually changing the envelope. So with none of this, uh, we're, we're not changing the information we're giving them, we're not giving them any re rational reason to want to donate. Um, the information was exactly the same that the charity had in the envelope already. We're just adding these little nudges in this case um, to see if we can have an impact on behavior. The third example was cognitive ease. So just making it very, very clear to people that this is the donation envelope. So this isn't just a, a leaflet for you to throw in the bin. This is something for you to donate to charity. It's an appeal. Fourth, we had something called affordance cues. Now affordance cues are, are cues in your environment that tell you something or tell you what to do without having to physically tell you. So if you see a, a handle on a door, that's an affordance cue that tells you to pull the door. You don't have to put a big sign saying pull, we just know it from the affordance cue. What we tried to do here was just shift the exact same leaflet from a landscape orientation to a portrait orientation. The idea being that perhaps people feel more comfortable putting money in if they're putting it in from the top than in from the side. Next we have salience, so drawing attention to something we thought was important. Here we used gift aid, so gift aid is uh, in the UK you can boost your donation by 25% for free to a charity just by ticking a box if you're a UK taxpayer and putting in your details. Um, so we thought we'd draw attention to that because hopefully people would, would want to uh, feel like they can donate more to the charity for free. And then finally, um, the last intervention was something called costly signalling. And this is where how you say something can actually signal a lot, a lot more than what you're actually saying. And the signal in this case was just using thicker paper. So we thought if we use thicker paper, then hopefully it signals to people that we're serious about this and we really want them to donate. We've invested um, more, more money into these envelopes because we're serious about this campaign. Now, just before I let you know the results, I just want you to have a guess at which one you think was the most effective. So you don't have to write it in the chat, but you can just note down which of these do you think is gonna be the most effective at driving more donations? And equally, which one do you think is gonna be the least effective? So which are the most and least effective? That'd be interesting, I think, when you compare that to, to the actual results. We were certainly interested um, that some of our predictions didn't, didn't hold true, which again just goes to the importance of testing. So, hopefully everyone's had a guess. The results then. So if this was the control envelope, this is 34 pence per envelope that is returned, and that's with everything considered, so with all the envelopes and the cost of the envelope and the amount per envelope and the number of people, et cetera, et cetera. Making clear it's an appeal, increased it by 10%. So 10% more donations on average, just by making it clear that this is a donation envelope. So a tiny, tiny change uh, is leading to a big impact on people's donation. Hand-delivered stamp, uh, increased it by 13%. So hand-delivered by your local volunteer. Really successful there. The thicker paper, increased it by 14%. So well done if you said that. So the same envelope, just with thicker paper, led to a 14% increase. And incredibly, the portrait orientation led to a whopping 17% increase in donations. So very, very well done if that was your pick at home. Interestingly, urgency and salient gift aid actually both decreased the number of uh, donations or the amount of donations. So well done if you guessed either of those. Um, we can speculate as to why. Perhaps people uh, are less likely to want to wanna put the gift aid because they know they've got to put their address down. Perhaps it makes you feel less good for doing a good thing, i.e. donating to charity, if we're saying, oh, we're gonna give you some money for free. Um, whatever the reason, I think it's, it's important to see that all of these interventions are very system one, and they kind of work in, in principle, in theory, but it's so important to test these counterintuitive things because then we can see what really works best. And from that, we can then create some more recommendations. So some of these work well in comparison, sorry, in conjunction with each other. So put a portrait orientation, a thicker weight, perhaps one of the, the hand-delivered stamp on it. So we can really build on these recommendations to get to what is hopefully the optimum envelope for increasing charitable donations. The next example, just a relatively quick one, 
um, is a project we did for Adobe. And Adobe had a completely different challenge. They asked us, how can we improve customer retention rates in our call centers? So people would phone up Adobe and say, I'd like to cancel my Photoshop subscription or my InDesign subscription. Normally, the answer that companies will give to this is, let's offer people financial incentives. So let's say, well, can I offer you a three month free uh, trial, for example? Can I offer you some money back? Actually, is there a way of getting over this problem without resorting to those costly financial incentives? And the answer was surprisingly trivial. Um, we actually behaviorally optimized the call center script just to remind people why they joined in the first place. So normally you would phone up and the first question would be, can I ask why you're looking to, to leave today? Actually, we just changed that ever so slightly so that the first question you're asked is, can I just ask why you signed up to Photoshop in the first place? Suddenly people are then primed with this positive mindset and they're listing off the reasons why Photoshop is or has been useful for them. It becomes a lot easier for the customer service representative to then reel back the conversation into ways that they can help that customer rather than starting off on the negative and the customer has already kind of made their mind up. So just by that tiny, tiny tweak, we save 1.9 million pounds in customer retention. So dare to be trivial, I think is the, the takeaway here. Now, conscious of time, but in maybe the next five minutes or so, um, I'd love to talk you through a bit of our work in behavioral safety. So this is quite a, a unique kind of area. Um, and we've done a lot of work recently in factories. And really the, the, the principle here is that humans have evolved very slowly, but factories have evolved incredibly fast. So we have these massive machines, this, this very kind of noisy um, industrial environment that humans just aren't well adapted to. And it means that we do get uh, injuries happening in factories. And again, we believe that the, the technological advancements making these machines safer and safer and safer have kind of reached uh, a bit of a peak, a bit of a plateau. But actually, is there a way that we can use psychology to increase safety in a way that technology couldn't? Now, a really interesting bit of insight that we used here was actually from Olympic boxing. So it seems kind of weird, but it's these lateral insights that can be really useful in psychology. Now in Olympic boxing, uh, in the Beijing Olympics, I think the Beijing Olympics, um, it, it is no longer allowed for you to wear a protective head guard. So you can't wear a um, helmet anymore in Olympic boxing. And they did that to increase safety. It seems kind of the wrong way around. But actually, if you're wearing a helmet, you're more likely to go, all right, I'll just take this punch in my head and then I'll get him back on the uppercut. Actually, if you're not wearing a helmet, you're far more likely to act defensively, to protect your head, uh, and then to, to um, avoid injury. So actually, injury rates go down when you're uh, not wearing a helmet. So we thought, is there a way that we can use this insight? And here we thought, well, actually, when you're in a factory, you're wearing so much PPE, protective equipment, like this hard hat, your steel toed boots. The workers were telling us, we did a lot of kind of research in these factories, and the workers were telling us they kind of feel a bit invincible. It does make you feel invincible. And, uh, um, Continue. Hopefully that is muted, could just hear it a typing. Um, it makes people feel a bit invincible. So actually, is there a way that we can make them uh, feel less invincible so that they protect themselves a bit more? And the solutions we came to in the end were a range of PPE, these protective equipment that remind you that inside um, you are very fragile. So here we had kind of skeletons and a brain inside your protective hat, hard, hard hat. Um, and we looked at a range of different solutions for these. So from graphic images, photorealistic, skeletons. And here you can see the skeleton gloves uh, in play in the, the factory. Now, we looked at the self-reported, so the kind of qualitative measures of safety and people said they feel, felt safer. Um, but they also tested it experimentally. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't kind of go through uh, this in too much detail, but essentially we asked people, we showed a range of people, a range of different circumstances with people wearing different kinds of gloves um, and asked them about how risky they thought the behavior was. Or do you think they could be, the person could be more risky doing this behavior, that kind of thing. Essentially what we found was that, um, especially when using kind of small instruments like a Stanley knife, 
we had a 13% increase in vulnerability wearing our new gloves compared to just wearing standard gloves. And that increase in vulnerability, just like in Olympic boxing, then leads to safer behaviors in the workers. A second kind of concept within the factories was this, the, the padlock. And basically in, in these factories, these are paper mills in America, um, you, you lock out a machine when you want to go inside it. So if you need to go inside it to fix it, you put your padlock on the machine and that then locks it off. So no one can start the machine when you're inside. It makes a lot of sense. Very, very safe. The problem comes from humans. So people are just in a rush. You can't really be bothered to go to the, through all the effort of locking it off. Uh, you know you've just got a dart inside. You can see there's no one around. People just go inside and actually that can be very, very dangerous. So how can we encourage them to use those padlocks? to lock those machines. And again, the more system two solutions, so making it very clear, telling people that it's important, just haven't worked as well as they perhaps could or have reached a plateau in how well they're working. So what else could we do? And here the idea was quite simple. We use the locks themselves to remind people of why they are wanting to come home safe that day. We put pictures or engravings of their loved ones, of their children, their pets, so that when they see those locks, they are reminded of their need um, to be safe. And we presented these to, to staff with this lovely kind of messaging, um, talking about it, reframing it as a big blue promise. Suddenly, it's not just something that you have to do to tick a health and safety box. It's something that you want to do because you want to come home safe that day. And they've been a massive hit uh, in the factory. And that's a couple of examples here. Now, I can see it's uh, 22, so I'll skip over this final example. Uh, this was increasing direct debit signups. Um, and just wanted to leave you with three points about what can I actually do differently. So if you're going to take one thing away from you from this talk, then hopefully it will be the next slide. So firstly, my recommendation is that the opposite of a good idea can also be a good idea. So remember the Red Bull Coke example and test counterintuitive things because your competitors won't unless they've been listening to this. Um, Number two, think more system one and less system two. So people, as we've seen, are a lot less rational than we might think. Remember that people are in their system one mode of thinking a lot of the time, so actually don't rely solely on system two messages in order to try and change behavior. And thirdly, just dare to be trivial. So actually, it's tempting to think that the bigger the idea, the bigger the impact it can have. Actually, sometimes the smallest ideas can have a far, far greater impact and for a lot less cost than some of those massive ideas. Um, so that's me. I'd say if you are interested in any of this stuff, I highly recommend Alchemy, which is Rory Sutherland's book, um, where he talks about these uh, in more detail and other kind of uh, examples and recommendations. And then also, um, I'm not sure if people have heard of Nudgestock. I know some of you will be on this mailing list already, but Nudgestock is essentially our annual festival of behavioral science that we put on at the behavioral science practice. Now, normally this is a day, a day in Folkestone where we have some really interesting talks, speakers for the day, um, all about this behavioral science, but it's just human behavior in general. And um, so it's really, really interesting range of speakers. Um, this year, obviously we can't do an in-person event, but we're gonna do it online instead. So Nudgestock goes global this year. Um, I think it'll be on the 12th of June. Uh, we've got some, some awesome speakers already. I think we've got someone who's Cambridge Analytica, or ex-Cambridge Analytica speaking. Uh, we've got some Silicon Valley gurus. We've got a happiness expert. We've got an expert on cooperation. Um, so do check out nudgetalk.co.uk and sign up to the mailing list uh, to hear about that. Um, and that's, that's it from me. So thank you all very much for, for listening. And happy to take any questions that people might have. You're welcome to um, write them on the chat or to, to unmute and ask them in person, and I'll stop uh, recording this as well. Thank you.